For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Here's what Paul said in verse 12. He's, and these are commands. They're in the imperative mood, the word fight. And, and you remember he play, he, he's working with uh, play on words. Uh, in verse 12 he says, fight the good fight of faith. The word fight is an imperative. Take hold is an imperative. Uh, when he said fight, he put it in the present tense. And when he said take hold, he put it in the aorist tense, which was important, and we talked about it. Take hold of eternal life to which, eternal life to which you were called and, and made the good confession. Actually, it says, and confess the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now, He's going to come back and he's going to issue a charge to Timothy in verse 13 and 14, which is my lesson. He says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, watch this now, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Then he brings that charge further the charge goes on that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we want. I want to talk about that. This time he says, I charge you, and then he deals with a chain of command. Watch that now. I charge you in the presence of, he just came out of that idea in verse 12, um, take hold of eternal life to which you were called and have made the confession a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the, look, he comes back to the idea, in the presence of the chain of command, the supreme chain of command. The, and that goes with this military word of charge. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things. That's, and then Christ Jesus who testified the good. And then you, Timothy. So what he's done, he's gone from God to the Lord to Timothy. And Timothy is in charge, as uh, Al mentioned in the first hour, is in charge. Uh, he's been set up to take charge over, over many under Paul's leadership. Uh, in the church, and and this is what he's commanding Timothy, and Colossians, Ephesus, Colossae and Ephesus, and places like that. I charge you in the presence of the God who gives the... So he, he gives a chain of command here, and then the question is, okay, I see the chain of command. I charge you under the chain of command from, the, from God the Father to God the Son to, to, through you to Timothy. So the chain of command is God, the Lord Jesus, Paul, the Apostle Paul to Timothy, and Timothy to the church. That's, that's how I got involved, because Doctrinal Studies Bible Church is part of that church. So the command from God to the Lord Jesus, uh, to the Apostle Paul, to Timothy, and it's come to me. I charge you. And then what he charges him with, after he gets through uh, to, uh, of that, he gets to back to Timothy, he goes through the chain of command, and then he comes back to Timothy, and he says to Timothy in verse 14, you, and that's, that's a second, that's a singular, second person singular, just like the you was in verse 13, he's talking to Timothy, you keep the commandment, and then he, he, he describes how he's supposed to keep it, uh, and, uh, and how long. I mean, Timothy is going to be engaged in this ministry until when? Well, one of two things. The one he mentions here, until the Lord Jesus Christ comes. I mean, Paul anticipated the imminent return of Jesus Christ, just like many of us do. We expect it to come in our generation. It may not, 
But every generation since Paul has expected it. In fact, they anticipated it more in the first century than we do in the 21st century because Jesus, they, there were many who were witnesses who heard him say when he was taken up in a cloud, I will return just as I, I will return just as I've left. And so the, they, they saw that. And so every generation since then has, has looked to the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We look for it. I don't look for it based on signs. I base it, base it on the eminence of his word. He said, I will return just as you've seen me leave. I will return. And, and everybody in the early church just believed it would be in their lifetime. And pastors I sent under who died believed it was coming in their time. And I believe it's coming in my time. So there you have it. You can say, so, so Paul, so now the question is, what is the commandment? Because it's singular. It has a definite article with it, duh. And then antole is the commandment. What is the commandment? Well, he's told us what the commandment is. Here's the commandment. Here's the commandment. You know how you get a commandment? You put imperative moods in it. So we got fight the good fight of faith. We've got take hold of eternal life and make this confession a good confession to the end. This is what, and what is that good confession? Eternal life. That was, eternal life was the good confession he made for, before Pontius Pilate when Pilate hung him on the cross and put a placard over his head, said king of the Jews in all the three major languages. So let's take a look at this this morning in the time I have left. What is interesting is the word charge. <clears throat> Paul uses it in a military structure. Paul was, many of Paul's words uh, were, were, were either athletical or militarily, or military. He, 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 apparently, he really liked these two areas of his life. I mean, if Paul, I suppose, was here, he'd be watching uh, football this afternoon or basketball. He loved sports and he loved military. And if he wasn't there, he was out on a military parade or watching the Roman soldier. He was intrigued by the Roman soldier. Of course, he spent a lot of time with them. <laughs> he got to know them intimate. But, um, but he talked about them and didn't talk about all the jails and the boats and stuff he was on. It, 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 apparently, seasick was not something he cared to talk about. So but he, but he, he over, he, but he doesn't. And so we got the word charge. And so I want to spend a moment with you with this word charge. It's made up of a compound word in the Greek. It has the preposition para, meaning alongside. And then angaleia, uh, angaleia is the word to announce or uh, a message. And he, in this case, uh, the word reason this word charge is used. I want to show you something interesting. In First Timothy. Paul uses this word five times in the book of, in, the, in 1 Timothy. I wrote this down because it's unique, because the English is really struggling with this word. They struggle with this word. For example, in, in the first chapter, verse 3, they translated this same word, I urge you. In the first chapter, verse 5, uh, uh, instruction. In first chapter, verse 18, it's translated command. In the sixth chapter, verse 13, in our passage, it's the word charge. And in verse 17 of the sixth chapter, it's called instruct. Same word. There's no way you would ever get that. And yet, this is a military word. It's, it's, he's pulled this out of his experience with the military and it fits perfectly for Paul in talking about bringing a charge, which means this in the military of Paul's experience with this word in the Greek language. It means that a, an order has been issued from the supreme command, and it's going to go down through that chain of command. Each chain of command is going to accept the responsibility to fulfill it. 
it's, not, it's going to move through each command center of responsibility who takes charge of it when it's passed from one to the next. When the next one gets it, he's in charge of it until it's given to the next one. That person's in charge of it until he gets to the next one, until it gets down to the, to the, to the guy who's going to execute it, until it gets down to the foot soldier. See, a lot of times we just think about a chain of command as if it floats down and but listen, when it leaves headquarters, when that five-star general issues that command and gives it to the next person in command, that next person takes it as if it is he owns it. And the guy who's given it to him salutes it off and moves forward onto another project. And has done that all the way down until we get to the execution of the order. So when he sets this thing up, he does that. God issued the command. It went to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is over the church. He's the head of the church. He gives it to the Apostle Paul, because the Apostle Paul is the, is the field general. He's the field general. He gives it to him, suits it off. Paul takes it, and Paul puts it now in the hands of the guy that's got to execute the plan with the people. He gives it to Timothy. And he's telling Timothy, I want you to take responsibility for this. Don't let anybody, listen, this command come from Supreme. Don't let anybody tell you you're too young or you're not mature or none of that stuff. You don't do that. This command, you, you take this with your life. This is, your, this is your moment. This is your time. This is what you're responsible for. And listen, when, when God gave it to Jesus, he saluted it off. When Jesus gave it to the Apostle Paul, he saluted it off. When Apostle Paul's got it, now he's down to Timothy. Now we're down to the foot soldier. Timothy, that command guy, that field command guy that's got to break it down into, into the specifics of the execution of that plan, which is the church's. That's what's going on in this word charge. And you can see how difficult people... Now, they got it right in the sixth chapter because they, they saw the big picture here. But listen, this word has been going on since the very first chapter opened up. And In fact, listen, once you see those what I call markers that are systematically used, here's what he did. Paul opened the book up with it, and he closed the book with it, didn't he? Just like you talked about today. Let me tell you how Paul opens a book. Pay attention. Listen, when Paul opens a book, you take a look at it. When he first starts it, you look at it. Then I'll tell you what you do. You go back and take a look and see how he closed it. It's always interesting what he does with it. You know why? Because he's a great he is a great communicator. He's a great speaker, and he understands how, how you tell somebody. Then you get him to do it, and then you tell him, either tell him what he did good or tell him what he didn't do good, but you wrap it up at the end by telling him what you wanted from him, not what you expected, and now whether he got it or not is how you close it out. We do it as parents. Everybody does this that is in a command mode uh, place. Well, anyhow, it's just interesting. This book is a very, this word we're dealing with, the word charge, is interesting. And, and while it was clear in Paul's mind, it hasn't been clear in the translators. They've been all over the place with it. And, and listen, I don't, I'm not being critical of it. Who am I to criticize these people? But I'm just saying to you how difficult it was. And so they tried to bring that word into the meaning of, of a word. You know, when you look in a dictionary, you got a first meaning, a second meaning, a third meaning, a fourth meaning of the word. So that's what they're working with. They're not moving away from it. But they've lost some, in my opinion, not just my opinion, they've lost some of the dynamics of what Paul was trying to do with this book. Because he did it, and he opened with a book, and then he closed with a book, and everything in between it is very important. So... That's just, you know, I'm not, that's just, that's the way I think, having studied Paul a great deal. Five times he uses this word. Now, in today's lesson, I want to focus on the idea, because what the charge was, he tells where the charges come from, 
and he tells him what he wants him to do. I want you to keep the commandment. But you see, that makes it very... In Tolly, people go like, well, what's the commandment he's talking about? What commandment is he talking about? Well, you're talking about the, those things that were the, 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 what we'd call the charges or the precepts are the commands. The imperative mood is a mood of command. So once we see where Paul's mindset is as he works this down, we know, well, what were the commands? We know the commandment went down. What was the command? What was being commanded of us? Do you understand? That, that, so that's very simple if you study the Greek language because we know in verse 12 is connected to 13 and 13 to 14, and there we are, agreed? The good confession business. So we know that if you have an entole, a commandment, you've got to have commands. What has been commanded us? And that is, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of eternal life, and bring it into a good confession, a good doctrinal concept. And don't let keep the commandment means, and don't let, let and what's in a, don't let anybody take you off that. This is the execution on the field. This is what must be done on the field, in the church. And it's the doctrine of eternal life. You fight that good fight, you never, you never waver in that fight, and you take hold of eternal life. It is the, it is the confession of the good confession. And that command comes from the Father, through the Son, to us. So, in regard to that, I wanted to show you the supreme command, which I discussed a moment ago. You'll see this command, that what we call the chain, divine chain of command. You'll see it all over the Bible. You know, when, he, when Paul talks to the marriage, he says, here's the command to the marriage. The, the chain of command, God to the, the Lord, to the husband, to the wife. And he, here, here's the command in the family, from God to the Lord, to the parents, to the children. And, and this always goes on. Okay? So the supreme command was very important, and I covered that in point one. This is true in all everything we study. That chain of command always works that way. It always works the same way. And the charge that's being given, you'd better pay attention to it. Because it's going to wind up to those who have to execute it. When God tells you how the husband is supposed to behave in it, he better be paying attention because that's field duty. That's, that's the code of conduct business down there. When the wife is instructed that way, when parents are instructed, children are instructed. These are big time. This is when the command, the command that has come down uh, becomes functional. And you need, you and I, most of the time, we're in, a, we're in the field position where we've got to execute these commands. We've got to execute them. We've got to, listen to me, what does executing mean? Here's what it means. I've got to fight the good fight. Of, I've got to fight the good fight. I've got to take hold of eternal life. I've got to make the good confession of confessions. No matter what my circumstances are, no matter what other people say, I've got to stick to the Word of God. I've got to stick to what's been sent down, commanded of me. What has been commanded of me? What has been commanded of me? Fight the good fight. Take hold of eternal life. I can't tell you, both of these, the devil, the devil's, listen, if you're struggling with these, welcome to the real world of battle. This is the real world of battle. Fight the good fight. You, he's, either, he's either got you surrendering your sword or not, not being willing to explain to somebody eternal life. There's probably not a week goes by in my life I'm not talking to somebody who, who, who is just bewitched about eternal, about eternal life. So let you not be. Turning your Bibles to 1 John. You know, you don't have to have a lot of scriptures, but you do have to have a few. Here's one I like. Here's one I use a great deal of time. 1 John 5. You know why it's important that you have this? 
because you're told to fight the good fight, take hold of eternal life, and make a good confession of it. And I guarantee you half the people that you know don't have any good confession of eternal life in their life. They don't know if they're going to be saved. They don't know if they're saved. They don't know how long they're saved. They don't have a clue about eternal life. Now, you gotta, you've got to first explain to them, if you're saved, you have eternal life, and they need to understand where the security is. Now, watch this. I'm in 1 John 5, 11 through 13. The witness is this, that God, watch the chain of command, God has given us eternal life. Where did we get eternal life? We got it from God. See, that's what Paul said in our passage. He said, God is the giver of life. He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about all forms of life. But in this passage of good confession, he's talking about eternal life, isn't he? The good confession is God gives us, the believer, eternal life. When does he do that? Point of salvation. All right, you're writing. All right, you, you, you wrote that down, didn't you? All right, listen to this one. How about John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would what? Not perish, but? So what, what's he have to do to get eternal life? He's got to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus Christ do that earned this for me? He went to the cross and died for my sins. was buried and raised from the dead third day. Do you know what's interesting? John. The Gospel of John. John's a guy who brings this out both in his book and in, in 1 John. Do you know he does something real hard? Look at, let me go for verse 12 and I'm going to come back. He who has the Son... See, the witness is this. God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son, from the father to the son. He who has the son, so it goes from God to the son and from the son to me. If I believe, it goes to me. It don't go to me unless I believe. The witness is this. God has given us eternal life. This life, eternal life, is in his son. He who has the son has the life, eternal life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Now watch this. Here's what's important for you sitting here today. You say, well, Ron, I believe that. Yes, but you've got a lot of friends that don't because they don't understand how the chain of command works in salvation. From the Father to the Son and from the Son to those who believe. The Father gave eternal life to the Son. The Son has eternal life. If you're in the Son, you have eternal life. If you're not in the Son, you don't have eternal life. And so, listen to what 13 says. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that, in order that you may know you have eternal life. How do you know you have eternal life? Because the Bible, the Word of God says that God gave eternal life to his Son, and if you're in the Son, you have eternal life. How do I get in the Son? I've got to believe that he died for my sins that separated me from the Father in eternal life. That's what, John, that's what he said in John 3, 16. The, listen to what he says in John, in John the 5th chapter. You wrote that down. John the 5th chapter, verse 24, because I'm telling you, You've got all kinds of friends who don't have this security, don't have this assurance because they don't know what the Bible says. Listen to John 5, 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, you know this is a big deal. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. You know why? Because the Father gave eternal life to the Son and the Son is able to give it to everyone who believes in him and does not come into judgment, but has been passed out of death into life. He said the same thing in John 3, 16. 
So here's what's interesting to me because of John's great writing. In the Gospel of John, he pounds this all the way through. John is the guy who says, you've got to believe. He, he's the theologian of, of believe. But you know what? When you read John, the Gospel of John, as soon in the Gospel of John, as soon as Jesus dies on a cross, is buried and raised from the dead, we're now, listen to me, we're now in chapter 20. Go to chapter 20 in John. We are now in, we are now in the book of John, and we have, we, have, we have gone through details of the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection in, in the Gospel of John. John has gone through great detail In the 19th chapter, he's crucified, he's buried, and in John 20, he's raised from the dead. That's the gospel. Now watch. L look how he closed that episode down. The last verse of 20. Look what he said. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And he's just covered the details of the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ before he closed it down. And then he closes it down and he says to them, I wrote these things so that you could have the confidence, the hope, the confident expectation that you have eternal life. Because God put it in Jesus. Jesus, when you go to Jesus, you get it. Eternal, that's, what, that's what John comes back to, that subject matter, in his book of 1 John, 5th chapter, verse 13. Boom, there it is. I wrote these things that you may know. Listen, if you don't know, it's because you don't open the book. Or you don't have a friend that can open it. Listen, we should be that friend that can open the Word of God and give them the truth from the Word of God. It is what is written that guarantees their conversion of salvation, eternal life. It's what's written. I love how he did it too. He said, this is the witness. You need to be a witness of this to people. They don't have it. Listen, your job is not to convince them. Your job is to show them in the word of God what God says. The Holy Spirit will convict them. I often say to you, listen, I deliver the mail. I don't read it. I deliver the mail to you. You've got to take this stuff serious. And let me tell you, I, while many of you take it seriously, you're missing a great opportunity to share with people who don't have that security. I hear people all the time using a negative uh, out of false hope. You, do you, if you died, do you have the assurance you would go to heaven? Well, I hope so. They're using it as a false hope. You know, listen, what do you mean you hope so? You can know so. And when you open the scripture and say, these things have been written that you may know. Now, I don't have to explain that. I have to, may have to explain why you could have that. I may have to explain the gospel. But I don't have to do that. So another thing that's kind of interesting is back to my subject matter of Timothy. Another thing that's quite interesting so I want you to be good ambassadors. You're not a good ambassador if you just explain the gospel and don't give them the assurance of it. You've got to give them the assurance. You've got to have, now for me, I, it was John 10, 28 through 30. You may have, you may have, but you open the scriptures and have them put their eyes on it. That's an ambassador. Be a complete ambassador. If I can find Timothy again, let me close this thing down with. It's interesting that when, when uh, Timothy, when Paul gives this to Timothy, and he, he tells him 
I wrote this down at point three, um, to keep the commandment. I don't know if I wrote, oh yeah, I did above that. I did in, at the end of point one, I said, Timothy, that you keep terero is an aorist act of infinitive. That's unusual. I mean, if you were just kind of guessing at what that might be, I don't know if you'd ever guess, keep the commandment. It doesn't have a two in front of it. It doesn't have an ing with it. I mean, there are a lot of ways that you can identify infinitives naturally in English. I don't know if you'd ever get that. But I'll tell you something interesting about the infinitive, which is a descriptive way to describe something. An infinitive is just a, a way to, for you girls, it's your makeup, you know. It's your final touch, you know, after you look in the mirror and you go like, yeah, and then you hit a little here and you hit a little here and a little there. And, and you walk out and you look like a million dollars and, we, 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 we guys have no idea what you might look like if you actually washed your face. We might be a completely different person. I don't know. But my point is that the infinitive is that kind of thing that you look pretty good as it is. Why are you doing that? Well, it's the finishing touches. It's kind of like the guy washing his car kind of thing. It's got to look. It's got to shine and look just a certain way. The infinitive is a, a descriptive idea. Now, when you put an aorist infinitive together, you are pushing a fact. A fact. And that's kind of interesting. So, when he says to Timothy that you keep the commandments, it's pushing now without stain or reproach. He forces you Okay, I'm going to keep it. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Uh-uh. It's not just keep it. It's to keep it a certain way until a certain time. The infinitive forces you to look beyond it. Keeping is not just keep the commandments, fight the good fight, and keep and take hold of eternal life. I know they... I drive you guys nuts in the back when I move away from. Listen, keeping, keeping the commandment is to fight the good fight, take hold of eternal life without and until. That's the power of the infinitive to make sure that you understand all of the facts. In other words, when you're out in the midst of combat, you don't leave your post. You don't take cookies and donuts over to the enemy and see if you can woo them over and be pardoned for it. You do this without reproach without stain this word it uses the word until the appearing the epiphany is the word in the english the appearing but he uses a unique uh, preposition it's called rare it's a genitive and it, it it throws a spotlight you're to keep the commandment without these two things until the coming of Christ, until the victory is over. We fight the good fight until Jesus Christ comes back. We take hold of eternal life and make the good confession until Jesus Christ comes back. And you do it in the midst of a world who's trying to distract you away from this truth and this fight. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way. Thank you for a great lesson from Al on hope, faith, love, and hope. Depending on the context in our life, it depends on which one is dominant, but they're all three important. 
Here we're told eternal life. We're told to fight a good fight. We're told to take hold of eternal life and make a good confession of it. And don't let the world distract you. Don't let the world lie to you. Be a good soldier. Show other people. Enlist them into the truth of the word of God about this war we're fighting. And we must fight this fight until the epiphany of Christ. Until the appearing of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful word for those who are fighting. Those in the midst of battle, overrun by the enemy, and they hear the bugle. They hear the, they hear the bugle of the coming of the charge against the enemy. We will hear that bugle. We will fight that fight until we hear that bugle charge. Reinforcements have come. King of king and the Lord of lords has now taken on his role. May we keep the commandment to fight the good fight Take hold of eternal life. Don't leave the fight. Don't leave the post for any cause, whether it be personal sin or apostate thinking, until we hear the bugle call that our Lord has appeared. Victory has been won. In whose name we pray. Amen.